Next, we talk about the payback period. The payback period is the number of years it takes to recover the initial cost of the investment. If we take a simple example where the initial investment is 100, then you get 30, 30, 30 and 30 over the next four years. What is the payback period? By the end of year three, you have recovered 90. By the end of year four, you recover 120. Clearly, the payback period is somewhere between three and four years. But what is the precise answer? What you need to do is the following. You need to recover 100. To go from 90 to 100, that is another 10. What you assume is that between 90 and 20, the 30 is coming in continuously. So if the money is coming in continuously, how long will it take to get 10? The answer is 10 over 30. So the total amount of time that it will take to recover is 3 years and 10 over 30 or 3 and 1 thirds of a year or 3 years and 4 months. What are the advantages of the payback period? As you saw, it is very easy to calculate. It is easy to explain. It's an indicator of a project's liquidity. If you have two projects, one with a, with a liquidity of, say, three and one third years, and B, which has a payback period of, say, six years, Clearly, A is more liquid because we get our money back faster. What are the drawbacks? This method does not consider cash flows after the payback period. Therefore, it doesn't really tell us about the profitability of a project. We might have a situation where project A finishes at the end of year four. With the $100 investment, we get a total of 120 in four years with project B, even though it takes longer to recoup the investment, but it is possible that after the payback period, we get five times more than the initial investment. In the payback period, the amount that we get after the investment has been recouped is ignored. So it is a very poor measure of profitability. Does not consider the time value of money and this method also does not consider the risk of a project. The discounted payback method, this is fairly straightforward. The discounted payback method uses the present value of the estimated cash flows. It gives the number of years to recover the initial investment in present value terms. To come up with the discounted payback period, we need the discount rate. Let's say that's 10%. And if we go back to the same example where the initial investment is 100 and then 30, 30, 30, and 30, rather than simply using these numbers, we have to use the present value equivalence of these numbers. The present value of minus 100 at time zero is minus 100. The present value of this number would be 30 divided by 1.1, then 30 over 1.1 squared, 30 over 1.1 cubed, and 30 over 1.1 to the power of 4. To come up with the discounted payback period, we use these numbers. And we'll make you practice a question on the next slide. The drawbacks, again, like before, this method does not consider any cash flow beyond the payback period, and it is therefore a poor measure of profitability. Given what you have just learned, I want you to come up with the payback period and the discounted payback period, assuming a rate of 10%. Here is what you should come up with for the payback period we take the undiscounted numbers. Investment is 800 and then 340. At the end of two years, we have recovered 340 plus 340, which is 680. End of three years, we have recovered 102.
two zero. The payback period is between two and three years. To come up with the precise number, we say two plus one twenty. One twenty because from six eighty to eight hundred, we need another one twenty divided by three forty because that's the amount that we are getting over the third year. So the correct answer is two point three five. That is a payback period. Discounted payback. The initial investment is 800. Then, as we saw on the previous slide, we have to take each of these numbers and come up with their discounted value or their present value. The present value of 340, the first 340 is 309. The present value of the second 340 is 281. We came up with this number by saying 340 divided by 1.1 squared. And then 255 is 340 divided by 1.1 cubed. So step one is coming up with this row, which gives us all the present values. Then we come up with the cumulative numbers. At the end of year one, we recover 309 in present value terms. End of year two, 590. End of year three, 845. 845 is simply 590 plus 255. Here again, we notice that we will recoup the 800 somewhere between the end of the second year and end of the third year, or in the third year essentially. To come up with the precise number, we say two years plus 210. Where is this 210 coming from? It is 590 plus 210 gives us 800. So 210 divided by 255. 255 is the difference between 845 and 590. So the discounted payback period is 2 and 210 over 255, which is approximately 2.8. I hope this is obvious to you, but the discounted payback is always going to be greater than the payback period as long as we have a positive interest rate. If the interest rate is zero, then the discounted payback and the payback would be the same, but that is very unlikely. Next, we come to the average accounting rate of return. This is seldom used, but it is mentioned in the learning objectives, so we need to understand this measure. The average accounting rate of return is the average net income divided by average book value. If you have a project and for this particular project over a three year period, we compute the accounting income every year. In period one, the accounting income is 10, period two, accounting income is 20, and period three, the accounting income is 30. In terms of book values, let's say that the book value is 110 at the end of period 1, 120 at the end of period 2, and 130 at the end of period 3. The calculation is straightforward. Average net income is 20. So 10, 20, and 30 average number is 20. Average book value is 120. So this gives us our AAR, or average accounting rate of return. The decision rule between multiple projects would be to pick the project with the highest AAR. As you notice over here, this method violates one of the principles that we talked about, which is that we should use actual cash flows rather than accounting numbers. Therefore, this particular method is not too important, but you should still know that it exists. Profitability index. Profitability index is the present value of a project's future cash flows divided by the initial investment. And there are two formulas that are mathematically identical. Let's take a simple situation where you invest 100, so that's the present value of your 
initial investment. And then let's say that the present value of the future cash flows is 110. The profitability index is the present value of the future cash flows, which is 100 divided by the initial investment. So that would be 110 divided by 100. So that is 1.1. Notice that the second expression here is mathematically identical. Here we say that the profitability index is 1 plus the NPV. If your investment is 100 and the present value of future cash flows is 110, that means the NPV is 10 divided by the initial investment, which is 100. So here again, we will get 1.1. The decision rule is straightforward. You invest in a project if the profitability index is greater than 1. A profitability index of 1 means that the present value of the future cash flows is equal to the initial investment. If the profitability index is greater than 1, then that means that the present value of the future cash flows is more than the initial investment. This is identical to the NPV rule. Do not invest if the profitability index is less than 1, and that is fairly obvious. Now, what is the advantage of this measure? Even though it's not used very often, but there is a basic principle here that you need to recognize. Consider two projects, A and B. In project one, the investment is 1 million and the NPV is equal to 0 0.1 million. In project B, the investment is 1 billion, so it is a thousand times bigger, and the NPV is equal to 0 0.2 million. With project B, the investment is 1 billion, and the NPV is 0 0.2 million. If projects A and B are mutually exclusive, then purely based on the NPV rule, we would select project B because it has a higher NPV. However, we would be missing an important point. If you consider the profitability, then clearly project A is more profitable because the profitability index for A is 1.1 whereas the profitability index for B is just slightly more than 1 because for B we have in the numerator 1 billion plus 0 0.2 million divided by a investment of 1 billion. This number is just marginally more than 1. By coming up with the profitability index, we can see that project A is substantially more profitable. Next, we come to the concept of the NPV profile, which is very important. The NPV profile shows a project's NPV graphed as a function of various discount rates. The NPV is graphed on the y-axis and the discount rate on the x-axis. What I want you to do now is create the NPV profile for this project. Here is what you should come up with. At a rate of 0%, the NPV is simply based on the undiscounted cash flows. So the NPV should be 240. If you add up all these numbers and subtract 400, you should get 240. If you plug in a rate of 5% and compute the NPV, and you should be doing this using the calculator, you should get 167. So at 5%, we come down to 167. At 10%, if you compute the NPV, you should get 107. And the NPV is zero at a rate of 22%. There are some important points to note over here. The y-axis intercept is simply the undiscounted cash flows. To come up with these numbers, we simply plugged our cash flow into the calculator along with 
the relevant discount rate and came up with the NPV. This intercept on the x-axis is the IRR. If you remember the IRR definition, it is the rate which makes NPV equal to zero. On the x-axis, the NPV is zero. Therefore, on a calculator, if you simply plug in these numbers and compute the IRR, that will give us the x-axis intercept. So that's how I came up with this final number. What I want you to do now is the following. You are given two projects, X and Y. X is the one that we just worked with, and we also have project Y. I want you to draw the NPV profile for both projects. And just to get you started, here is the axis you need. NPV is always on the Y axis. The rate is on the X axis. We already came up with the NPV profile for project X. Let's say that this is project X where the X axis intercept was 22%. On the same X and Y axis, I want you to come up with the NPV profile for project Y. Here is what you should come up with. The y-axis intercept is clearly 400 because if you look at the undiscounted cash flows, investment of 400 and then 800 at the end of year 4, if the discount rate is 0, then you have a NPV of 400. And very simplistically, if you calculate the IRR for project Y, you will get approximately 19%. And you just connect these two dots. If you want to be more diligent, you can also calculate the NPV at various discount rates. But from an exam perspective, knowing the fact that the y-axis intercept is based on undiscounted cash flows and the x-axis intercept is the IRR, that's what will help you a lot. Now, this point where the two NPV profiles cross is called the crossover point. The significance of the crossover point is that at the crossover point, the NPV of both projects is the same. So there is a particular rate which clearly is less than 19% because 19% is the IRR for project Y and you can see that the crossover is to the left of that point. So at this point, the NPV of both projects is the same. If X and Y are mutually exclusive, then which project is better? And the answer depends on the discount rate. If the discount rate is less than the rate associated with the crossover point, so to the left of the crossover point, then the blue project or project Y is better than project X. And to the right of the crossover point, according to the NPV rule, then the red project or project X is better than Y. According to the IRR rule, project X or the red project is always better. In our particular case, with a discount rate of about 10%, which is roughly over here, the blue project or project Y is better. Later, we will talk about the conflict between NPV and IRR, which we have briefly identified over here. I want you to try this example now. Here is what you should come up with. In red, we have shown the NPV profile for the initial scenario investment is 200 and we get 80 every year for four years if the discount rate is zero then the npv would be 80 times 4 which is 320 minus 200 which gives us 120 that is the vertical axis intercept the x-axis intercept is the irr if you calculate that to the closest whole number you have 22%. In blue, we show numbers assuming the improvements have taken place. 
the cost goes up by 30 so the project cost becomes 230 360 is essentially the new cash flow which is 80 plus 10 or 90 times 4 360 with a zero discount rate the NPV is 130 which is shown right here so the vertical axis intercept moves up when you compute the IRR for this cash flow you should get approximately 21 percent so the horizontal intercept shifts left the correct answer therefore is a